Good morning. Today's scripture reading is taken from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, and I invite you to stand, please. The Son is the, <clears throat> the, sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or power or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fulfillment dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once we were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusations. If you have continue, sorry, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Steve. I have a lawnmower that I want to tell you about. It is dependable. I have a faithful lawnmower. It starts every time I pull the cord. I don't know how long that'll last, but while it is that faithful, I am oh so happy with it. We like faithful, dependable. Everybody appreciates a faithful dog. I mean, who wants a dog that wants to go snuggle on somebody else's lap? Or goes to somebody else and won't come when you call it. You want to know what that dog is going to do. You want a dog that's dependable. And that dog's faithfulness to you is related to how important you are to that dog. You don't want a dog that just only comes when it's in desperate need. You want a dog that's faithful and dependable to you all the time. We appreciate that kind of faithfulness in the military, we call it patriotism because the soldier values his country more than he does his own comfort or his life. That's faithfulness. We appreciate that. You know, I am probably more faithful to my car at changing the oil in my car than I am to my lawnmower. Much as I like that lawnmower, the car is more important. I change that oil regularly, and I'll bet you could catch me long overdue on changing the oil in my lawnmower. It's just not that important. And so, because my wife is so important, I ought to be very faithful to my wife. I ought to be dependable to her in every way. She ought to know my integrity and know what to expect and know what, what, what I will do and how I'll act and behave. She ought to know my faithfulness. More important than even my wife is our relationship with Almighty God. If I'm going to be faithful to my wife because she's important, I ought to be extremely faithful to Almighty God because he is important. And so often, we're probably not that way. We're more like the dog that comes running home when he's hungry, you know, or he's got a porcupine quill in his nose or something, and he really needs something. We ought to be faithful to God at all times. We ought to stay faithful to God because he's the one that's important. In this section of Colossians chapter 1 that Steve read this morning, the Apostle Paul, speaking by the power and the authority of Almighty God, writes to encourage Christians in their faithfulness, to encourage them to resist all the temptations 
all the human philosophies that might lure them from a complete, sincere, extreme devotion of their lives and all their thoughts and activities to God in Christ. In this section that was read, I would, ex I would suggest that uh, Paul's primary thought is to help them to maintain their faithfulness by understanding who Christ is. Understanding who Christ is, is the prime motivation to our faithfulness. So I want to look at this passage and I want to pull out some things to help us understand who and what Christ is and why he's so important to us that it ought to promote our extreme faithfulness. First off, I would suggest, I would suggest that we ought to understand who Christ is in regard to the creation. Because he is the creator of all things. Now we generally think, oh, God created it, Genesis chapter 1. But throughout the New Testament, Jesus is described as the creator. And as you go back to that Genesis passage, God spoke and there was light. And when that word becomes flesh, that's Jesus Christ. So Jesus is there even in Genesis 1 with the creation. Here in our passage today, verse 16, for by him. And if you work down through those pronouns, you see that that him in verse 16 is Jesus Christ. By him, all things were created, right? Go back to Genesis. God said, let there be light. And that's Jesus Christ, that word. By the word of God, it came into existence. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or ru powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him, Christ, and for him, Christ. Visible things were created by him and for him. What are we talking about? Sun, the moon, stars, that lawnmower, that dog, your children, popcorn. Go on, anything you can see and touch, visible. God created it, and the invisible. I mean invisible. We're talking about ghosts. We're talking about all kinds of things. We're talking about things in the spirit realm. We're talking about love. We're talking about honor and integrity. We're talking about hope. We're talking about magnetism and radio waves and electricity and how all those things work on your Internet out there in cyberspace. God created all those things. He created powers and authorities. In other words, the rulers, the kings, the presidents, the dictators, the principles that govern life. Some of those things seem messed up to you. Sometimes they do. They don't always work the way I think they should. But they're created by Christ and for Christ. And he knows what's going on with them. He's looking at it. He's watching it. And it is operating and un un unfolding according to his plan. Maybe that gives you a new perspective on that. You know, the things that, the things that I get distressed over, visible, invisible, powers, rulers, authorities, principles, he created them. They are under his control. He knows what's going on. He created all things including you and me. What kind of response does that imply for us? I mean, he made me. What kind of devotion do I owe him? It's not like I just came to him out of nowhere. He made me. He's my creator. What kind of faithfulness does that mandate to the one who made us? That's pretty powerful. I go back into Isaiah chapter 29, and there are folks there who've got some things mixed up. They're complaining about God, and they're sneaking around, and they, they're trying to do things on their own, and they're hiding things from God. And Isaiah 29, 15, he says, you folks have got it backwards. You've got it mixed up. He says, woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord probably been guilty of that somewhere. God's not watching right now. I can get away with this. Who do their work in the darkness and think, who sees us? Who will know? Verse 16, you turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. God's different than us. 
What shall, or shall what is formed say to him who formed it? He did not make me. Can the pot say to the potter? He knows nothing. He knows way beyond us. He's the one in control. I owe everything to my creator. He holds everything together. That's verse 16. All things were created by him and for him. Everything is for him. He is the goal of your job. He is the purpose of your life relationships. Everything, he, even your hobbies, are you fitting into that objective? All things created by him and for him, the essence of all things. He's, he's the essence of the physical things and the spiritual things, the present things, the eternal things. Verse 17, he is before all things. We're talking about Christ now. And in him all things hold together. Now, I call that magnetism or something keeps the planets from flying off into space, right? And the airplanes fly around. Why don't they just go zooming off? Because there's gravity. Well, no, because he is governing those principles. He is what holds things together. He's that, he's that mind that keeps everything. I mean, the, the, the bench that you sit on, why don't those molecules just take off? And you wind up sitting on the floor. I mean, he holds that together somehow. I don't understand all those dynamics. But he's the one holding it together. He's got that ingenuity. He's got that power. He's got that overall encompassing things we don't even think of. You know, I read a while back about uh, ice. We have one element on planet Earth that expands when it gets warm, like everything else, but there's one that expands when it gets cold. And so ice doesn't shrink and go to the bottom of the pond. Ice floats and protects everything throughout the winter. If ice shrunk and sunk, there'd be no turtles or frogs or fish. They'd all freeze solid. But somehow in, he, he makes it all work is what it amounts to. Life depends on the tides Seeds, some of them need to be frozen first. You've got to put them in your freezer for a year if they don't get the outdoor winter because they've got to be frozen before they'll germinate. Who understands all those kinds of things? Who ordains all those kinds of things? Who put them in place? He's the one. He holds everything together. Does your life honor him? Is that kind of essential? You know, it's like... We're the astronaut, and our total life depends on this hose, you know, this lifeline that's connected to the space shuttle. He is our lifeline. How could I be unfaithful and move away and, and, and cut off that lifeline and just expect to come back to that lifeline when I want to? I need to be faithful to that lifeline at all times. We need to be faithful... And we'll be motivated to be faithful as we realize who Christ is in relation to God the Father. You know, how does one see, how does one relate to invisible? Because I've never seen God the Father. You know, some big, some big being come in here with long gray hair and a big long beard and, and a booming voice. Now, God's not physical. God's spiritual. And you can't see so how do you relate to something? How can you be pleasing? How can you understand something you can't see? You know who I am by my appearance, but do you really know me? You look beyond the two ears and the two elbows, and uh, you got to see who I am inside, and that's an invisible thing. If you're going to really know who I am, you got to see me other ways than with your physical eyes. But Jesus lets us see the very nature of God the Father in a physical manifestation and in the behaviors of that physical manifestation. Colossians 1.15. He is, that's Christ is, the image of the invisible God. And when you look at him, don't look at his two ears and his two elbows and say there's God. You look at love in the flesh, truth in the flesh. Spirit at work in human form. And you understand 
John 14, verse 9, when Philip asks the question, Jesus answers, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? It's not a physical thing. You need to see the Spirit. You need to see that life essence at work and what that life essence consists of. That's God, and we can see that in Christ. John 1, 18. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who's at the Father's side, has made him known. That's the significance of Jesus Christ. I relate to Jesus Christ who was physical in the form of flesh and I can say, aha, now I understand God. Christ is how God is revealed to the creation. To know God the Father, look to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who tells us and instructs us about God. To see the Spirit, to see the nature of God, ask what would Jesus do in this situation? And see where the love comes across. And the grace and the mercy. And the obedience and the strictness. You know, the Old Testament's also a record of who God is. Sometimes it's hard to understand in the Old Testament. You know, it's in the Old Testament concealed is in the New Testament revealed in Christ Jesus. He helps us to know God the Father. In fact, Christ is the very fullness of God the Father. Verse 19, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Christ. Not a part, the whole. You know, there are some religious groups that don't recognize that truth. But God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. There is nothing lacking. What is deity, what is godness, is there in Christ Jesus. Christ is not simply an angel. He is not simply a prophet. He is not a little god. He is not just a good man. In fact, the apostle saw it worth repeating in chapter 2, verse 9, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. What's deity? Deity is the essence of God. All the fullness of Godness lives in him in bodily form. So relating to Christ is in reality relating to God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. That Word that spoke things into existence became flesh and blood. That very essence of deity became flesh and blood and lived amongst us to help us understand and relate to the Father. Number three, motivation for our faithfulness to God. We need to see who Christ is in regard to our own soul salvation. You know, to understand that, we probably need to first recognize that we were lost. Because if we don't realize how lost we were, we don't recognize the problem. We don't see the significance of that salvation. Ephesians 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us. You feel bad because you got a sin someplace? A sin in your past history that you've repented of? Hey, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, it's by grace you have been saved. And you read that and you appreciate where you were and the significance of Christ bringing you out of that to a saved situation, a transformed, a God-likable, a, a, a God-ordained creation, one being recreated in the likeness of God, unless maybe... 
you're still lost. Maybe you were hostile, and maybe you still are hostile. And that's something maybe we ought to, you know, maybe, maybe some of us are still alienated from God. And we need to hear that gospel message and turn to Jesus Christ in faithfulness in order for that soul salvation. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 describes some of this. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. You know, the friends that you talk to and forces throughout the world say, ah, don't pay attention to that. But he emphasizes it. He says, don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, that's all kinds of sexual immorality, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. You just ain't going to get there in that lifestyle. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed in Christ. You were sanctified in Christ. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. You see the significance of Christ and the call for our dependability, our faithfulness, our devotion to him? When were you sanctified? I mean, we used to live that way, but you were sanctified. I hope you were sanctified. When were you sanctified? When were you washed? When were you justified? I suggest that baptism is the marking point. That's the turning point. That's significant here. That's where it fits in. When were you washed? 1 Peter 3.21, this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of who? Jesus Christ. There's Christ, and there's that making that pledge. There's that coming together, making that appeal once again. When were you sanctified? That's that same point. Acts 22, verse 16, and now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. Sanctification is getting ready to fill, get, getting rid of that dirt. Not dirt on the flesh, not, not soil and sweat and that kind of grime. We're talking about spiritual dirt. We're talking about sin. Wash that off. And here's where it happens, calling on his name. When do you call on his name? That's that baptism again. And that's that sanctification that takes place at that point, but is also ongoing as I am transformed and changed and I clean this up and I clean that up and I become more and more like him. But you were justified. When were you justified? when I made that appeal to him for a clear conscience in the waters of baptism, that's where he paid the price for our sins. That's where I made that appeal. That's where I entered that covenant. That's when I was clothed with Christ, Galatians 3, 24 through 26. When I died to self in that watery grave and come up a new creature to, love, to live for God. We ought to understand that Christ's sacrifice is the only thing that brings that reconciliation. That's why it's so important for our soul salvation. Colossians 1, our text for today, in verse 20. Through him, to that's through Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Here's how God the Father is getting it done. He's reconciling things to himself through Christ Jesus. Romans 3.26 says, He did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. You know, my five-year-old throws a ball through the neighbor's window. And I say, ah, forget about it. Don't worry about it. That's not just. That window needs to be paid for if I'm going to be just. But that five-year-old can't pay for it, so the daddy pays for it. Same thing happened. God, the very word of God, became flesh and paid that sacrifice, our debt that we owed for our sins. So God is just and justifier in Christ Jesus. Down to verse 22. 
Now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. When I'm in Christ Jesus, there is no room for any, com any complaints. God will find us holy and pure. Even Satan can't find an accusation. The accuser cannot find any legitimate accusation. Colossians 1.18, he's head of the body, the church. Church is the people. They've been called out. They are the reconciled people. They're the soul-saved people. Those who worship God with their very lives and spirit and truth, who wholeheartedly, faithfully belong to God through Christ. That body, the church, functions as Jesus functioned when he was here in the flesh. That fulfills Christ's purpose. Ephesians 1 may state it more clearly in verse 22. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything and every way. That church, us together, Christians joined together, is a living organism, dynamic in that same spirit of love and service to the Father that Jesus had when he was here in the flesh. Is that you? Are you part of that? Are you part of that living organism, which is the church? And do you live faithfully like you are? You see, he's the head of the body, the church. He's the head. That means he has that prestige. He has the power. He governs the whole. He's the boss. Read with me again Colossians 1, our text for the day in verse 21. It says, once you were alienated from God. And we're enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if. It's a big pause there. Because if is a big word. There's stuff contingent on that if. All this is true, and we have that security, we have that soul salvation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Emphasis on that if. You realize, do you appreciate what you have in Christ Jesus? If you really do, you can never play around and lose that relationship. That relationship with God the Father through Christ Jesus, that soul salvation relationship is everything that's worthwhile. It is the ultimate in importance. You are reconciled to God only through Christ Jesus. Christ is your only hope. And there's the motivation to continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast. Folks, Jesus Christ is the single most significant thing in your life that has ever happened, that ever will happen. In regard to your having a life, in regard to your living a life, in regard to your continuing on to eternal life with God the Father. Folks, we must continue faithful to Christ in all we think and in all we do. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, Help us to be faithful. Help us to examine ourselves and see where we fall short. Give us that openness and that courage and, and uh, just that wisdom and insight to see whatever in us is not dependable to your call and is not faithful and true to you in every way. Help us to fix that. You are so important to us. Help us to be faithful and true in spirit and in truth. In the name of Christ, amen. Folks, if, uh, if anybody stands in need today, if anybody stands in need of prayers, 
If there's something going on in your life that needs to be repaired, that you could use some spiritual assistance, guidance, direction on, we stand ready to serve. If we can pray together, if anybody does not have this saving covenant relationship with Christ Jesus, we stand ready to help you understanding that and moving forward with that as well. Why don't you come while we stand and close with a final song and a prayer.